Alex Thier, and I am the director for our Afghanistan and Pakistan programs here at the Institute. And uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you here for what I think will be a fascinating discussion. Um, one that I personally have been waiting many months for, um, for a variety of reasons. I think we've all been waiting many months uh, to be at this point. Uh, I had a discussion with <coughs> Steve Hadley um, in August this year, just before the Afghan elections, in which we said it would be great to do a session on the way forward for Afghanistan. Let's see how things shake out over the next few weeks. Um, and those weeks uh, turned into months, uh, and here we are today on December 7th. Um, finally, I think on the other side um, of what has been an interesting and uncertain period for all of us, um, to examine the situation in Afghanistan and more broadly, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the region, um, with three of the most interesting people and interesting minds, I think, that could be brought to bear uh, in this discussion. What I'm going to do is introduce them briefly and say a few words, uh, and then we're going to conduct today's uh, event as a discussion. Um, I will lead uh, the three um, uh, in a series of questions and uh, answers and perhaps repartee if it gets to that, uh, and then we will have an opportunity for the audience to speak as well. Um, so let me begin uh, by introducing Ashraf Ghani. Ashraf Ghani uh, is really someone here, I think, uh, who does not need introduction. Uh, he has been a fixture um, on the international stage since 2001. Um, he is now the chairman of the State's uh, Effectiveness Institute, the Institute for State Effectiveness, I think. It's wrong here in the bio. Um, and uh, prior to that, or congruent with that, he was also the chairman uh, or chancellor of Kabul University. Uh, but I think what we all know him best for is having served um, as Afghanistan's preeminent aid coordinator and then minister of finance um, through the first several years of Afghanistan's transition. Um, at that time uh, and since and before, for people who knew his work as lead anthropologist at the World Bank, um, I think Ashraf is in many ways best described as an unending font of ideas. A discussion with Ashraf um, always yields uh, a series of new and interesting ideas um, and uh, just based on something he's about to publish, one of which I think we will explore today. Uh, second uh, is uh, Stephen J. Hadley. Steve Hadley, uh, between 2001 and 2009, sat at the absolute apex of the United States national security infrastructure. He served four years as deputy national security advisor to President Bush under Condoleezza Rice and then as national security advisor for four years. Uh, prior to that, Steve also served as assistant deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, for International Security Policy um, under Dick Cheney uh, during the first Bush, or Bush one, um, uh, has also served as a lawyer and served uh, on the National Security Council under President Ford. Um, Steve has had a long, eminent, and fascinating career in government, and among other things today will, I think, be able to provide us uh, a level of insight that few of us have access to about uh, the cauldron uh, of decision-making uh, that our president has recently come through. Uh, and finally, we have Wendy Chamberlain. Uh, Wendy has had a fascinating career both in the United States uh, and overseas. Um, I, I think one of my favorite things that Wendy has done was serve as Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees. Um, leading the United Nations Refugee Agency that services the needs of tens of millions of refugees around the world. She was also an assistant administrator um, at USAID. Uh, she was director of global affairs and counterterrorism uh, <clears throat> at the National Security Council. And uh, perhaps most pertinent to this discussion, although not exclusively, also served as our ambassador to Pakistan. So Wendy has seen it all in the field, at home, uh, in the United Nations, um, and has a really amazing amount of experience uh, to bring to bear on the questions that confront us today. 
So let me start by quoting President Obama on December 1st. Uh, President Obama said, it is in our vital national interest to send an additional 30,000 U.S. troops to Afghanistan. With an additional 7,000 allied troops that have already been announced, that brings the United States and its allies to a total of over 140,000 troops in Afghanistan, more than the Soviets arguably had uh, at the height uh, of their occupation of Afghanistan. And this comes notwithstanding what our allies pay at a cost uh, to the United States now of 110 to $120 billion per year. We also discovered uh, a new term for those who were paying close attention to the international press. Um, our surge has a name, and its name is Max Leverage. Um, this came out in a piece, a very interesting long piece in the New York Times yesterday that described the process of deliberations that the President went through to reach this point. And I think that it, this max leverage idea, approach, or philosophy had four key points. First, the forces are going in quickly, more quickly than the military commanders had at first requested. They're going in to, quote unquote, seize the initiative. They're going to accelerate the training of the Afghan National Security Forces and the overall transition of handing over to the Afghan National Security Forces and the Afghan government as a whole. And then they are going to start to leave quickly. Uh, the President said, again quoting, we will begin the transfer of our forces out of Afghanistan in July of 2011. Much discussion in the last few days has centered precisely on that line. How quickly is the United States planning to withdraw from Afghanistan as of July 2011? Or as a, another way of putting it, how steep is the backside of that curve? Does it trail out over a long, long period of time, or is it a rapid de-escalation uh, accompanying the rapid escalation that we have seen this year? But most importantly, we are here to examine the way forward today. And I'm going to uh, ask a few questions, and I'll sit down and start with specifically a few broad questions that we want to focus on. One question about this, uh, about this date um, that I think comes from the tension in the President's speech is that what if by July 2011 we are still in trouble or the Afghan forces are still not ready? Do we start to withdraw anyway? And does the passage of another 18 months make it less of a vital national interest for us to be in Afghanistan? What are the benchmarks, measures, outcomes uh, that we need to see in order to determine whether the United States is succeeding, whether the Afghan uh, forces are succeeding, and whether this transition is successful? How do we effectively partner with Afghanistan and Pakistan? Uh, that was really, I think, in many ways, the core of the President's speech, our partnership with the Afghan government and our partnership, or in some cases, lack thereof, with the government of Pakistan. Um, and finally, the biggest challenges and opportunities um, that we face in doing this. So. I, I want to move uh, and start the questions, uh, starting out with you, Ashraf. Um, you are a, an Afghan, uh, a proud Afghan, who I think through your writings and speeches have made clear some suspicion or skepticism of grand schemes that are going to transform your country from the outside. And I'm wondering, how you react, perhaps stepping back not only from the President's speech, but more broadly from eight years of engagement in Afghanistan, and now having reached this, this force level, at least on paper, of 140,000, <coughs> is this overall approach to Afghanistan something that can, in fact, succeed in stabilizing Afghanistan? Well, it's a pleasure to be with you, and thank you for the very kind words. Can you hear me? Oh, do you want me to go there? No, no, no. we're going to remain sitting. Sorry. Oh, the cameras. Um, I, I don't. We're, the the nature of the event is going to be such that uh, we're going to be back and forth between everybody. It wouldn't be feasible. If there's some way to adjust the cameras or lift them up, or <laughs> Which sorry, heads are in the way. Maybe the, just the one or two heads could shift to the side. Please. Okay. 
the question is not use of troops or their number. Numbers alone are not going to make the difference. The issue is what kind of overall goal is there, what degree of coordination between the civil and the military is there. Because the part that is really impressive about the speech is that the political governance economic side is absent in action. The security uh, community has gotten its act together. It's coherent. It is truly strategic. But the civilian component is missing. So we still do not have an overall United States strategy for Afghanistan. We have military security objectives for Afghanistan. This point needs to be uh, registered. Two, there is no commitment to funding Afghan security forces in the medium to long term. How can you ask a government to increase its military forces to 400,000, knowing full well that the national income is not sufficient to pay for 70,000? What gives and what is the nature of the dynamic that, that is to unfold? Every US soldier for a year in Afghanistan costs one, one billion uh, uh, dollars. Mm -hmm. So the deployment you know, has, in terms of numbers, an enormous implication. But what is the use of the Afghan security uh, forces, and how do we bring the necessary flexibility and the necessary partnership? Three, the strategy is articulated in the absence of Afghan voice. Not because the United States does not want Afghan voice, but because the government in Kabul has been incapable of offering voice. The classic, you know, when we pulled Bill Taylor, uh, uh, Mr. Hadley, and others were with us, and I think they would testify that during the first period, 2001 to 2005, almost all the key initiatives came from Afghans. The international community was being pulled by us, not being, we were not being pushed by the international community. This pulling and pushing has changed. Uh, because when all is said and done, only the, the nationals of a country can own the country. Your presence, you know, your partners, is going to be temporary. All of us know that. The question is, what kind of partnership do we bring about that the exit from Afghanistan is with honor and dignity and leaves behind a stable Afghanistan? In this slide, I think the President of the United States, the National Security Council of the United States, and the United States people have a lot of challenges in front of them. It is not going to stop with the speech. It's going to be an ongoing series of work. And London is the first opportunity to change the relationship to a true partnership. And then Kabul, I think, within, say, a month and a half to two months of London, is essential so that we bring the national dimension and the regional dimension. Because we are operating at four levels. There's the international community led by the United States. And there are significant tensions within the international community regarding how Afghanistan should be approached. And we need to convince the American public, the European, the Japanese, that Afghanistan is worth the engagement. Second is the regional dimension. We live in a very difficult neighborhood. Our problems are not national. Our problems are regional in nature and we need to bring a regional dimension. Three is the national level, because you cannot ignore a national government. A national government, no matter how weak, is the legal authority to say no. So it needs to be brought into a partnership. And fourth is the subnational level, because complexity now in Afghanistan requires dealing with these four levels simultaneously. And this means that at the heart, we need to recognize 
There is no military solution in the long term for Afghanistan. We need a political governance economic strategy that puts in place the conditions and incentives. Two, use of force is necessary. We cannot ignore the fact that use of force is necessary to change the equation, but it is not sufficient. In three, the duration <coughs> depends on the coherence, the unity of effort, and a narrative. And fourth, as we embark on this path, we have to expect a lot of difficulties. One of those is the number of casualties. There are going to be Afghan casualties. There are going to be international casualties. How do we explain? How do we keep public support? Uh, all of this, I think, is manageable, but it's by no means easy. So hence, again, to conclude, we need to elevate the discussion to a strategic discussion, not to one of the number of forces or the 18 months. But what is the goal? How do we achieve that? How do we measure progress towards achieving this? And who, who constitutes the center of gravity? For me as an Afghan, the center of gravity is the people of Afghanistan. Because that is the most important judge. It's not the political elite of Afghanistan. It's certainly not the criminalized elements that control a substantial part of the economy or others. And unless the people of Afghanistan judge the process to be going in the right direction, it's not going to. So what have we lost? In 2001, December in 2002, we had the overwhelming support of the Afghan people for engagement with the international community. For the first time in our history, we surrendered the use of force in our country legitimately to international community. This is unprecedented for us. But the international community was not willing to engage. Mr. Hadley will remember that I, I was uh, bringing his attention that what would cost $10 million in 2002 will cost $20 billion uh, eight years later. The nature of the engagement did not take place. Now you're dealing with a skeptical Afghan political public and simultaneously with a president in an international community that has limited political capital at their disposal to turn the situation around. So we need to have a strategy that increases the political capital on the ground and internationally to move forward. Thanks. There, there's a lot of things in there that I hope uh, themes that we I hope we'll return to. Um, Steve, let me let me touch on one thing that that Ashraf uh, highlighted, um, and that is um, the character of the American engagement. Um, simultaneous with the last eight years, the engagements in Iraq and Afghanistan, we've been having a national debate here about how the United States pursues its foreign policy. And in some ways, the imbalance of resources that the military has uh, versus the civilian side. Um, one of the points that Ashraf is making is that this debate has been predominantly about the military engagement. Um, what is it that we need to do from the US perspective on the civilian side to strengthen our ability to engage and, and to actually engage with the Afghans to enhance the possibility of a successful transition? Well, there, there's really two aspects to that. And again, I want to pre express appreciation for the opportunity to be here and, and to join my colleagues. Um, there are really two things. One, there is a sort of a long-term problem, which is something that the U.S. Institute of Peace and a lot of other groups are working on, and that is, you know, a general theme that we've spent 60 years in this country learning how to recruit, train, exercise, fight, and improve our military. And we have a great military. And yet every time when we get into uh, needing to build institutions in post-conflict or pre-conflict or failing states, we do it as a pickup game. We tried it one way in Bosnia, another way in Afghanistan, another way in Iraq, and I can go through the details. But the truth is, we have not, I would argue, built the same kind of civilian institutional capacity to be a partner with our military in these post-conflict, pre-conflict, 
failing state situations. It is a natural national problem. We haven't done it. Other countries have not done it. The United Nations hasn't done it. We all need to develop these capabilities and have them interoperable. So in the same way that we can all go to war together, we can all go to peace building together. We have not done that. Uh, and it is a national project, and it's going to take a long time. In the short run, I hope Af Ashraf is not right. Uh, I hope that, and I have some uh, reason, if you look at some of the things that uh, General McChrystal has written and has been saying, I think there is a civilian surge, if you listen to Secretary Clinton, that is to accompany this military surge. I think it's, um, it's you know, you know, there's always a question of what do you put in in a presidential speech, and I think it's unfortunate that there wasn't more in uh, the speech about the civilian surge, um, because it is uh, a critical element. The security surge buys you time and space to develop governance institutions, positive economic activity, and to help train and empower Afghans to take responsibility for the future. That's why you put in the military, is to buy you time. And hopefully there is a plan, and I believe there is, to take advantage of it. <coughs> but the challenges are daunting. And one of the problems is uh, it is a great thing that there are over 40 countries who are with us militarily in Afghanistan. It is a great thing that there are many countries running PRTs and having a civilian presence. But it is very difficult to manage. Ashraf talked about the needing for unity of effort. Well, we need to have unity of effort, not just on the military side, but on the civilian side. And we are not organized well to do that. I'll give you one uh, anecdote. Yabdahoop Skeffer, who was, attorney, who was the Secretary General of uh, NATO, talked about how all his NATO countries were on the ground in Afghanistan, and most of them had PRTs. And he, supposedly NATO Secretary General, heard nothing from anybody about what they were doing. Each little unit was a fiefdom where a local country had its forces and its PRTs. We made some efforts to get some common, uh, some common rules of engagement, if you will, or common concepts uh, that would be reproduced in all the PRTs. We made much less progress than we need to make. So if we're going to do it, we're going to have to engage the Afghan government. They've got to know who to talk to. And we need, on the military and civilian side, uh, much more unity of effort, and then the kind of very close civilian military cooperation that we had in Iraq, that's what we need in Afghanistan. Wendy, let me just stay on this theme for a second. You've been at or near the head of two of the largest aid bureaucracies in the world. Um, in reality, how do we make this sort of partnering work? How do we simultaneously provide people who don't know the country uh, an enormous amount of budget, nearly all of the budget for certain national programs in Afghanistan, but at the same time make the Afghans the ones who are in the lead? It's, uh, it's very difficult, and I don't want to uh, minimize the difficulty. Just uh, uh, Steve's remarks just uh, made me remember a, a personal experience that I had. Uh, uh, Steve, in talking about the need for uh, unity of effort and unity of strategy as we go in, even on the civilian side, I can recall uh, the day that I uh, uh, first walked into uh, UNHCR, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees in Geneva, for my interview to be Deputy High Commissioner. And I had gotten met with the High Commissioner, and then I went in to meet with the uh, Assistant High Commissioner. And I'd been talking to uh, Kamal Morjan for about three minutes when he got a telephone call, uh, and he was informed that a UNHCR young French woman had just been uh, assassinated in Kandahar. And uh, his assistant, who was with me, an American woman, just collapsed on the floor in tears. And I had, uh, I had been determined that I was not going to take this job, but at that moment, I changed my mind. Uh, the sacrifice that these young U UN people make, uh, not often considered, not often thought of in our terms, uh, is enormous. So the, the, it, the, po the reason I make this point is to illustrate um, the 
the dangers of losing your humanitarian space. Humanitarian space was lost in Afghanistan. The, the more the military takes the lead, uh, the more all humanitarian workers, even UN workers, but USAID workers, who I have an enormous amount of respect for as well, having worked in, UNHC, uh, in USAID, um, become combatants as well. Um, the point, uh, the second point I'm making uh, is that uh, with regards to our PRTs, they're led by our military. You will have a PRT, even today, which will be primarily uh, military uh, personnel, maybe one or two, uh, aid or state. If you look at uh, the way the Germans do it, and there's a very good uh, German NGO study on how different their approach is to PRTs, it's primarily uh, civilian with maybe one or two military. It's, it's, a, it's a very different approach. So w yes, I agree with Steve. Uh, we, we do need to come together with our partners on approaches, but we're not there yet, and we have a long way to go, because this whole debate about humanitarian spa space, who takes the lead, um, uh, is, is fundamental. It's not just small. It's just not a matter of writing a, um, a, a briefing memorandum. Asha, let me make the, the question of partnership a little bit more concrete. Um, one question that is on everybody's mind is how we can succeed with President Karzai. Uh, you've known him for many years as boss, compatriot, rival in the recent uh, presidential elections. And can you give us some insight um, that explains the two prevailing portraits of him as the great conciliator and the darling of the West on one hand, um, versus the other image that is emerging more recently as the sort of hapless head of a corrupt uh, government or criminal syndicate. Uh, let me read a quote from something that you've written recently but is not yet published. Um, By restoring a group of rapacious individuals to positions of authority, Karzai essentially gave the Taliban the opportunity to make their comeback. By 2005, they were, re I'm skipping, uh, had, by 2005, they were regrouping and injustice had become the insurgency's fuel. Uh, right. The two portraits <coughs> come from two periods. The first portrait comes from 2001 to 2005. And the reason for that, I think, is important. Mr. Karzai has great talent in performing the role. He would get an Oscar for performance. No, he is a great communicator. What he can do in the little mosque, <coughs> in the palace, is few politicians can do. He truly has a godliest touch. But he has to have a script. The process in Bonn give us a script. The partnership that we established <coughs> in those years brought a team of Afghans that were determined to build a state in the face of opposition from everybody. because. We were not given the instruments. And in that regard, because he had to make decisions within a very tight deadline, the Bonn Agreement is the only peace agreement that has had temporal benchmarks, but very structured. Very, so every three months to six months, you had to move the process forward. And within that, Mr. Karzai could not delay decision take, taking decisions by more than a week. Uh, again. Bill was on the ground, uh, Steve was here. We worked very closely together to be able to produce uh, a narrative of forward movement. And the narrative was inclusive. Because what did we begin with, Bon? From an unrepresentative group of Afghans to get to launch a process that would result in the full sovereignty of the Afghan people for the first time electing their president directly. That narrative was compelling. And the play was so well coordinated that each act was known. So people knew. Because of this, uncertainty was taken out of the picture. And it's <coughs> in that time, remember, there were no Taliban. They disappeared into their villages. The leadership got isolated. The rank and file joined the process. Over 9 million people participated in the voting. And the voting process was a heroic act of national will. 
It was a fantastic drama. Eight-year-old women asked to be carried to vote. People literally took their ablutions because they thought they would be assassinated, but they took the risk. Uh, so this is the first portrait. Now, the problem with this is the West handed us a restoration. So Mr. Kaiser was handed a very poor hand. Now we need to acknowledge. Uh, the military strategy that was adopted in 2001 was to bring a group of people who were either in exile or in marginal places and hand them the all of, all of government. You know, we had an agreement from the UN perspective that Afghan forces would not enter Kabul, that we will be able to treat Kabul as a neutral space and create state institutions based on full participation. But instead, you know, Secretary Ramsfeld canceled the agreement two days before because he needed probably the CNN watch or other considerations. Uh, so w by the time Mr. Karzai took office, over 240,000 civilians had been appointed by Mr. Rabban. Over 400,000 <coughs> people were claimed to be in the security institutions. We, and a lot of the local power holders had relationships with Western uh, countries that protected them. Now, the second phase is 2005 to 2009, where he did not have a script, where the Constitution was compelling, but it did not translate into a concrete program of action. And Mr. Karzai's predominant wish was not to be presiding over a new round of violence. Because of that, he adopted a policy of conciliation. The problem with conciliation when you don't have institutions is that they eat through the institutions of the state. So what developed? Four major threats. First threat, narcotics. This is a 560 billion industry that is developed in the last eight years. Afghanistan's narcotics constitutes 20% of the global illicit trade of 360 billion a year. Out of this, 500 billion has gone to international actors. So Europe's failure, Central Asia's failure, Russia's failure, China's failure, to put security arrangements means that the problems are exported to us at the source of production. 20,000 to 40,000 Europeans have lost their lives due to uh, heroin addiction. But nobody sees it in the newspapers. 160,000 Russians probably have lost their lives. What's the outcome? $18 billion have been controlled by less than 1,000 individuals. $6.7 billion have gone to 1.7 million Afghans who are invo involved in ca cultivation. The drug syndicate became a cartel that became overwhelming. 25 individuals now are at top of this, 15 of them in the South. This became the cancer that ate through society. There was no coherent counter-narcotic strategy to contain this and to rise to it. Second was Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda managed to regroup while we were busy uh, going through our democratic transition phase. Uh, but they regrouped on the northwest frontier when our eyes were elsewhere. Three was the insurgency. And the reason for the insurgency, I think, is overwhelmingly because of restoration, injustice, and exclusion. People, I've talked to thousands of people in the South. The West does not figure pre predominantly in their narrative as to why they took up guns. Injustice by elements that have shown themselves incapable of governing the South between, 2000, uh, between 19... Uh, 92 and 1994-96 is the, is the issue. And the fourth is the transformation of the government as a result of both narcotics and corruption into a threat to the Afghan people. 
General McChrystal, I think following uh, the analysis that I offered in May, is very clear. ISAF's mission is threatened by two threats. The first is the insurgency. The second is the Afghan <coughs> government in the, in the political brokers. Now, moving forward, because that's the past, Mr. Karzai has an option. He can either become an outcast or he can become a statesman. To become an outcast, all he needs to do is persist with what he's been doing the last five years. That's not in the interest of Afghanistan. That's not in the interest of the region. That's not in the interest of the world. So our hope and prayer and arguments and uh, all we can do is to help him become a statesman. How do we do that? Again, by arriving at the roadmap where he can play the role that he's so good at. And the other is, the man is incredibly good when you give him options. If you give him three options, he can actually come and make the decision because he's very quick at seeing the political consequences of technical options. But you wait for him for months. He will not come with, with an option himself. We need to understand every political leader's strengths and weaknesses. We cannot turn him into a father of the nation without significant assistance. But that is what is required. And I, you know, the election is over. The West failed us, and failed us really badly. They didn't lift a finger to help us carry a democratic, free, and fair election. And the UN needs to be investigated by a blue ribbon uh, panel to seeing why, after expending $1 billion from 2004 to 2009 on elections in Afghanistan, could preside over such a debacle. Uh, but that's about learning lessons for the future. We've accepted Mr. Karzai to be the president of Afghanistan, not because of legitimacy, but because of necessity. I don't want blood in the streets of Afghanistan because there is political disagreement among a small group of political actors. We have a lesson. In 92, seven individuals that knew each other extremely well could not agree. And they brought the destruction of the capital and our entire political destruction. We are not going to permit any individual to play that, that role again. So that's the boundary. We have to accept necessity. But second is, now we have to gain legitimacy. Legitimacy in Afghanistan is a process. It's not a single event. So we need to have a roadmap to make sure that the people of Afghanistan, who've become very skeptical, both of democracy and development, are going to see real consolidation of democratic institutions in real delivery of, of services so we can move forward. I think this can be helped with, uh, but this requires a very sustained dialogue in building on the foundations of 2001 to 2004, because everything that works today is a product of what we designed during that period. So it is not that Afghanistan is incapable of, of institutions or institutional development. I, I don't think that there's the equivalent of national solidarity in Pakistan or India. Iran certainly doesn't have it in Central Asian uh, states don't. Our experience with telecom, again, I think is, is a first rate <coughs> sort of showing that we can bring. So there are lots of grounds for, for capability. The key is to be able to, and here if I make a point, you don't need a civilian search in Afghanistan. You need a civilian surge in the United States to support the developments in Afghanistan. The United States is not reaching to its core capabilities here. You don't need 20-year-olds or 25-year-olds uh, running around providing uh, six months short-term projects. What we need, for instance, I'll give you one illustration, then stop, is to transform Afghanistan's agriculture, we need a consortium of 20 top land-grant colleges in this country to work with us virtually. That is capacity building and mobilization to create a network of first-rate agricultural colleges. <clears throat> the market in Afghanistan works. You tell me get food to the remotest location in Afghanistan, distribute the cash, people will go there. You don't need WFP to distribute food in Afghanistan. I think we are being approached 
in, in a very uncontext-driven uh, way. Just because some African countries don't have the capability, now you in DP, uh, WFP or others, you know, the heart bless, uh, bless their heart with all these so alphabet soups. Uh, we need to Afghanize the process. In here, unless we remove the parallel governments that have been created by the aid bureaucracy, we're not going to succeed. These organizations are not accountable, they are not transparent, and they're not effective. So, and if you want me to read chapter and verse, just take a look at the last report of the Inspector General from the Defense Department. The cases of corruption that are being documented uh, are quite significant. So yes, there is Afghan corruption, but the international corruption is equally significant. And I think we need to add this both sides. Steve, let me, uh, you look like you're gonna react and, and you can say whatever you want. Uh, let me just, um, that uh, a lot of the successes that we might have seen or we might have been able to build on uh, disappeared. Um, I'm curious to get your uh, version of those events and, and, and what it is that you think has been driving the problems in Afghanistan. Well, I don't have a much disagreement with Ashraf and I think it's useful uh, to sort of step back if you listen to what he said. Um, there's a narrative out there that nothing happened from 01 to 09, that it was a complete period of neglect. Of course, that's not true. And as Ashraf described, between 01 and 05, we, the Afghans were doing very well, thank you very much. They'd implemented the Bonn Conference. They drafted a constitution, a very uh, progressive constitution. They'd had presidential elections. They had parliamentary elections. Uh, you know, this was a governmental process that was beginning to emerge. There was a lot of international aid that was coming in. There's always a question about how much could Afghanistan absorb. We had some sure. disagreements about that. <laughs> uh, there was a, by the end of that period, growth rate was over 10 percent. Uh, and in terms of security, we were building Iraqi, the, sorry, Afghan security forces. And there really wasn't a lot of violence in this country in 2005. So 2005, we all thought, you know, this <coughs> is working. 2006, in January, Afghanistan comes forward, Afghan initiative, with a national development strategy, which is approved in London, and then six months later is, fi is, is funded in Paris. So we're, we're thinking, you know, this is going in a good direction. And then what happens? Ashraf has talked to you about some things that happened in Afghanistan. Violence continues to go up. You know, I kept these charts of violence and it continues to go up. Second, the Taliban changed their strategy. And from direct engagements with our troops where they, they lost badly, they went to IEDs and suicide bombings. And, you know, drawing a page from Iraq. Narcotics goes up, absolutely right. But we also learned that with a strong governor and the right kind of policies, a lot of of provinces in Afghanistan actually in this period and after became poppy free. And something like 60 to 70 percent of the poppy gets produced in Helmand and Kandahar, which is of course where well, the Taliban is and where the government is not. Um, it's clear that the government in Kabul is laboring to try and extend its writ into the provinces and it's not doing very well. And finally it becomes very clear that the security forces we are building are too small for the need. But I guess the other thing I would say is, and we need to talk about it here, what happens in Pakistan in this period of time, which people forget. Um, and it begins, regrettably, in, a, in a September of 06, when President Musharraf has an initiative to develop peace agreements with tribes beginning in North Waziristan but with a plan to, to, to do in the tribal area. It made sense on paper. Tribals would agree to exclude al-Qaeda, keep the Taliban under control, the Pakistan army would step back, pull back, and economic assistance would come in. And we agreed at one and a half billion a year for five years to fund this program. It was an effort, if you will, at a counterinsurgency strategy. The problem is it did not work and these areas became safe havens. And they became safe havens not just for attacks into Afghanistan, but they became safe havens for attacks that started moving into the settled areas of Pakistan. 
And when in the spring of 07, the Pakistani government begins to realize what is happening, these are mistakes. Of course, in March of 07, President Musharraf removes the Chief Justice. Uh, there are demonstrations in the streets, and Pakistan goes through an 18-month political crisis that does not end until August of 2008 when President Musharraf resigns. And during this period, they're not paying attention. And we are hearing from our military this safe haven in Pakistan is a real problem for us in Afghanistan. And I remember with talking to Admiral Fallon and talking about how we were doing well with our counterinsurgency strategy in the east of Afghanistan. He was very optimistic. And this problem in Pakistan, as well as the problems in Afghanistan, I think combined to cause the situation to deteriorate. I don't want to filibuster here. I, I will be glad at some point to talk about what the st steps uh, the administration and the international community did through 06 and 07 in terms of expanding the size of the Afghan forces, increasing U.S. troops, increasing coalition troops, um, uh, seeking additional international funding. Uh, so we started a ramp up. Uh, but it was uh, not fast enough, not decisive enough, uh, I think, to get ahead of the problem. And I uh, think that uh, the Obama administration has made a difficult but right decision to try and see if we can get ahead of this problem. Um, but I, I will just say one more thing. In the end of the day, Ashraf is exactly right. It is about the Afghans. This is their country. This is going to be their struggle to win uh, in terms of the uh, insurgency, and it's going to be their struggle uh, to win in terms of building the institutions for the future. We can help them. We need to help them. But in the end of the day, um, the strategy has got to be uh, not um, to exit. The strategy has to be to succeed. And when we succeed, Success means the Afghans are able to take responsibility for their future with less and less support for us. When we succeed, then we can go home. But uh, I think it's been important to listen to the testimony of the national security principals over this last week to make clear that this is not, as you said, a situation where we leave quickly beginning in July of 2011. Quite the contrary. They are saying, this is where we begin a process of transfer that will let our people home, but they've been very clear how long it's going to take, what pace it's going to uh, take. They've been very clear not to put an end date. They've talked about it's going to be years to make because it is going to depend on our success in helping the Afghans build the institutions for their future. Um, so it's, I think it's important. It's a, it's a, it's a narrative, I think Ashraf is right, of five good years, three very difficult years, and hopefully now a commitment to get a strategy right in partnership. And the last thing I would say on, on partnership, President Karzai has an, an opportunity to, to be in some sense that founded the modern state and now saved the modern state in Afghanistan. And I think he will prove to be up to the task. He's going to need a lot of help. He's going to need us to come up with some benchmarks, uh, some things that we need to do and he needs to do if we're going to succeed. Secondly, he needs to know that we're behind him and we want him to succeed. There's got to be both, here are the things we need to do together, but there's got to be some assurance that we're going to be there over the longer term to make sure he succeeds. And finally, we need to help him get the kind of staff support and professionals around him that can help him make these choices, <laughs> that can help him make these choices and implement effective Good decisions. Good try, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> and with Steve, let me just ask you a really brief follow-up on this yes, question. Sir. Can you give an example? I mean, everybody's talking about how does the U.S. government get leverage over Karzai? How do we get him to make the right decisions at the right moment? Can you reflect on an experience that you may have had or that you oversaw in which 
we put pressure on Karzai in yeah. a positive way that, that yielded the right kind of results. Yeah. I, you know, I, I have a problem with leverage. I always thought leverage is what you get on your adversaries. It's partnership and support that you give to your friends. And the way you do it is very simple. We have a common problem. We need to have a, a common strategy. And for it to succeed, I have to do this and you have to do that. And I'll tell you, it, it, you know, we're now talking about an Afghan surge in terms of the Iraq surge. Before we ever announced that surge, President Bush had had a number of conversations with Prime Minister Maliki, and he basically said, here's what I'm willing to do in terms of a surge, and it's going to be difficult for me politically. But if it's going to work, these are the things I'm going to need you to do in partnership with me. And he got a prior commitment from President Maliki to put more forces into Baghdad, to let the surge go forward in a non-sectarian way, no safe havens, no shielding the Shia. Those were agreements he made in advance and announced to his own people before the president ever gave his speech on the surge. It wasn't getting leverage over Maliki. It was saying, I'm in. I'm your partner. This is what we need to achieve. This is how we're going to achieve it. And in order to do that, you've got to do some things, and we've got to do some things. The international community needs to do some things. We need to all make those commitments and then coordinate it and get it to go forward. So it's, I think leverage is the wrong word. It is strategic partnership to a shared objective, which is getting Afghanistan to be able to plot and, and, and carry out a, a bright future for its people. Wendy, let me come back to one of the themes that, that Ashraf touched on um, about our international aid practices. Uh, much of uh, our international assistance vis-a-vis uh, -vis Afghanistan, but globally, has moved um, from where it used to be, which is either direct implementation or cooperation with governments, into um, funding contractors. Um, and many have pointed out, including Ashraf, that um, this process of contracting and subcontracting sometimes cuts down the amount of aid that reaches the ground to 30, 20 percent even. Um, what do we need to do with our assistance architecture to be able to support uh, not only Afghan leadership but Afghan development of Afghan capacity as well as simultaneously delivering the things that Afghans are expecting uh, in order to to get them to develop confidence again in this effort? Um, if I could expand your question just a little bit to include Pakistan. I, I think we're, we're uh, it's, <coughs> it's AFPAC for a region, reason. And, uh, I, and the speech was uh, certainly included Pakistan as well as uh, Afghanistan, although I don't think the President got uh, uh, into P uh, Pakistan quite enough in his speech. But the challenges to our assistance is certainly true both in Afghanistan and Pakistan. They're very different challenges and I think require very different approaches. Um, uh, different approaches in both, but uh, these, the traditional aid model I don't think works in either one of them anymore. I'm not sure it works very many places uh, left in the world and we need a, a really thoughtful uh, renovation of our own USAID agency, maybe maybe that's uh, close to a failed state, uh, that we need to rethink. Uh, getting back to a uh, comment Ashraf made earlier, we, uh, we need to apply some of our core competencies here in, in America as well, because we need, we need USAID. We need a signature agency to do uh, a lot of the requirements um, that have been defined as, uh, as the solution by the President um, and certainly by the situation. But to get to your question, the traditional aid model, just to spell it out, is uh, a group of very smart people in USAID and the embassy sit down, uh, talk to a lot of people in the country, but then basically go back to their offices and write a country strategy. Uh, determine the sectors, I'm, I'm going to be very um, uh, simplistic here, determine the sectors to work in, uh, determine what needs to be done, write an RFP or a contract, let it out, uh, uh, and uh, because it's such an onerous uh, process dictated over years by congressional restrictions, um, they go to usually the same large NGOs and large nonprofit, uh, uh, for-profit companies, 
uh, that then get subcontracted out to any number of local NGOs uh, that actually provide it. Very difficult model to apply in either Pakistan or Afghanistan now because it requires monitoring, it requires getting out in the field, looking uh, at the projects, and, and security is very difficult, frankly, for Americans anywhere. Uh, particularly in Pakistan, it's a difficult model because there's tremendous resentment to this uh, method. Resentment uh, not only because uh, of the anti-Americanism that has almost become a definition of Pakistani nationalism, uh, unfortunately, over the last few years. Uh, it's even got a name. We call it the trust deficit. Uh, uh, and if you need evidence of this, just look at the reaction in Pakistan uh, to the Kerry Luger Berman bill. We were thrilled with this bill. I was thrilled with this bill. I testified both in the House and the Senate uh, in favor of the bill. And many of us thought this was just the answer to the trust deficit because it addressed two of the biggest complaints in Pakistan about the United States. One, that we would use them and leave them. We would abandon Pakistan as we had uh, after the 80s when they helped us evict the Soviets and we immediately uh, left. Of course, I don't think there's a Pakistani that remembers that the connection was really the um, uh, Presser amendments and their developing the nuclear weapons program. Uh, uh, it was simply we left because we got what we wanted and we left. And we would do it again. We would do it again when after they helped us fight America's war uh, against terrorism along the border in Afghanistan, we would leave again. So the first aspect of the uh, Kerry um, uh, Luger bill, or used to be Biden Luger bill, was it's for the long term. It's a five-year bill, which is quite extraordinary in the way we do uh, planning for bills. Quite extraordinary, but would send a very <laughs> definite message. The second message we sent also was an antidote to the anti-Americanism that had grown up in the last few years, and that was that we give we too much focus on the military. We stopped talking about our relationship with Pakistan and we, when we started talking about our relations with Musharraf. Uh, and this bill was meant to say, no, 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 no. Our relationship is with the people, the people of Pakistan. This is going to be civilian assistance. It would be explicitly not military assistance. And we thought this was terrific. Uh, sailed out, signed, president signed it, gets to Pakistan almost immediately, in fact, even before it gets there, the rea negative reaction came. Our press picks it up uh, as, uh, well, this is the military who re re are annoyed at us, see it as a finger in their eye because it's directed to the civilians and not to the military, and the military that didn't like some of the language that required them um, uh, to uh, uh, m do some stuff on nonproliferation and anti-terrorism. But you know, that's too facile. Look deeper into the sand pile and you'll see that this was far beyond the military. It hit the uh, Pakistani uh, public uh, and became widely unpopular uh, because the Pakistani public frankly didn't trust their own government uh, to deliver this assistance. The assistance uh, was directed towards funds going through the Pakistani government with the notion that if it goes through the government, you'll strengthen the government. The Pakistani people didn't really trust uh, their political elites, who they see as largely corrupt, and, and a parliament that, oh, by the way, is largely futile. Uh, what we sometimes forget is that Pakistan is, uh, did not make the change in 1947 that India made and is largely owned as a feudal, it's largely a feudal country owned by a very few families. That you have a, a huge, 100, 100 million Pakistani people <laughs> who are landless, jobless, um, most of them illiterate, many half of them illiterate, uh, with uh, no real hope for the future, who also share what Ashraf is pointing out to, a great grievance that their government doesn't provide uh, justice or education or services or jobs. The same, the same characteristics that make uh, the Taliban appeal uh, in parts of Afghanistan uh, appealing to the population and win recruits, you also have in Pakistan, and it basically gets to feudalism. 
So uh, this bill isn't seen by the people of Pakistan as remedying any of that. Uh, they see it as uh, uh, just going to line the pockets of uh, NGOs and uh, government officials. And frankly, they haven't seen uh, much coming their way from assistance programs in the past, although I think that's a little false. Um, uh, as Steve pointed out in Afghanistan, I think it's also false in Pakistan, but that's certainly the, the impression. Now, uh, this bill is still hung up in the Pakistani parliament, uh, but it will pass out. And it will pass out because it's perceived to be a huge amount of assistance. And I say it's a teardrop in the ocean. It is not a significant amount of assistance at all, given the Pakistani problems. Uh, this, this bill, if what the intention of the bill is to put Pakistan over the tipping point, over the, uh, the new word, I guess, is the inflection point, uh, where a prosperous, stable society that's uh, capable of, of uh, uh, providing jobs and standard of living for its people, uh, it won't do that. And it won't do it because it doesn't get, it doesn't encourage the kind of reforms in the Pakistan government um, that are required. It doesn't encourage land reforms. I don't see that it encourages um, uh, getting rule of law, which is very admirable in Pakistan, but down to the people, down to the villages. I don't see that it encourages uh, solutions for providing safety for people in the villages. Uh, the Pakistani people are saying, we don't want your police trainers. A bunch of Americans coming telling us how to uh, train our police. We know how to train our police. And indeed, they do. Uh, some of the uh, uh, police units in Pakistan are the best in the world, uh, not corrupt and very efficient. Problem is, they're just not everywhere, uh, or most places. <laughs> um, but what's to make them go most places? It's not a few trainers from the United States. It's reforming um, the way Pakistan um, uh, uh, appoints its police. And right now, in most places in Pakistan, it appoints its police. But the politicians appoint uh, police because they delivered votes. Uh, it's a patronage job, just as teachers aren't uh, trained teachers or teachers at all. They're people who delivered votes and then get the teaching job and therefore um, uh, collect the pay, but don't necessarily show up in the schools. So building more schools, unless you reform the way teachers are, are, uh, are recruited and uh, paid, uh, we'll just end up with more ghost schools. So I'm saying that our, to get back to your question, because I, I don't want to ramble, Come right back to it. I had a purpose here. And that was to say that um, the way we deliver aid is very important uh, to achieve what our goal is. And I don't think we have that model. And I don't see us going, I, the talk around town about how we're going to deliver this Pakistan aid, I think needs to be given a whole lot more thought. Um, it, it is, uh, some of the thought <coughs> is very much the traditional as I've just described, and it's also a little bit of, well, let's, let's use a, take a page out of the coin, out of counterinsurgency. Let's put our projects where the, in those sub-districts and districts where extremists have the highest recruitment rate. And oh, by the way, they happen to be the same sub-districts that are also the most impoverished. I guess there's a reason for that. It's the southern Punjab districts, the northern Sindh districts, Fata, uh, Karachi. Uh, I will maintain that's kind of doomed, too, because the anti-Americanism uh, is already much too strong uh, for you to be effective. Uh, and I'll just leave with one last thought uh, while uh, I have the microphone on this, uh, because it's an idea, and it's not even my idea. It's, it's to give some serious thought to doing what um, Secretary Duncan is doing over the Department of Education with Race to the Top. Uh, where he flips the model. He flips the model of No Child Left Behind. It was a little bit like our traditional aid. We set the strategy and we monitor to those goals. Two, let's set the goals. Let's set the goals and then offer to fund good ideas. And now, the, the attraction to me in this approach is that if you don't uh, 
if you set the broad goals, which can reflect a U.S. American values, we value safety for people in their villages, we value education as long as it leads to jobs, we value non-corrupt governance, et cetera. And you, we will fund those projects that provide plans that are achievable and competent to reach those goals. Uh, you're, you might be doing something else. You're, you're encouraging American values. Secondly, you're finding new leaders in Pakistan. People who are outside the elites, people who are outside of the, the lock on uh, these NGOs, um, open to everybody. A lot of smart people in Pakistan. A lot of smart people in the diaspora um, that are, have good ideas, who want to invest themselves in this. Open it up to them. Let them come up with new ideas. And they know their culture better than we do. And they know what's needed better than we do. Um, and uh, thirdly, you encourage innovation. Uh, and I think we have a lot to learn from the people <coughs> of the region in this way. So that's an idea on, on how to um, address a non-traditional model. Steve, you had a quick reaction? Before quick one. What Wendy's talking about is very important, because remember, in Pakistan, to help the Pakistanis succeed, that's where we don't have a security dimension. We don't have troops on the ground in Pakistan, and we won't, except for limited training and the like. So getting the civilian piece mm -hmm. right in order to help Pakistan is critical. Second point, we used to say that you couldn't get Afghanistan right until you got Pakistan right. It's also true now, you can't get Pakistan right until you get Afghanistan right. They go together, and if you think about, third point, Pakistan, as important as Afghanistan is, Pakistan in some sense may be even more important because a destabilized Pakistan raises questions for India, it raises a question of the competition between Taliban and the military for control of nuclear weapons. So these need to go together, and Wendy's point is right. On the Pakistani side, our instruments are civilian and economic, and they have to work. I'm going to come back to Pakistan in a second, but I want to follow the, uh, the economic line uh, with you, Ashraf. Um, I don't know if this is your phrase, but I see a, <laughs> I see a neologism coming. Uh, also in your new article, you talked about counterinsurgency economics. Um, one of the critical elements of the Afghanistan strategy has to be using entrepreneurship that Afghans are famous for. Um, you talk about this idea of counterinsurgency economics and to, it, within the overall framework of getting the Afghans, not Karzai, not as ministers, but getting ordinary Afghans fundamentally involved in their own destiny and their own progress, making them economic actors and making them have a stake in the future. Um, can you expand on, on that a little bit, that idea? What do you mean by counterinsurgency economics? Thank you. <clears throat> I mean, the first point of departure is that traditional aid does not work. I think we have a consensus on this. Aid has worked only in places where the national actors have taken their destiny into their own hands. Take Singapore, you know, who would have Gunnar Mardo, the most eminent expert on Asia, in 1965 predicted that Singapore will explode and into fragmentation. Yes, it exploded into fantastic growth. <coughs> and the World Bank predicted that, again, in 1960s, <coughs> that Burma and Philippines will be the giants of Asia, and Taiwan and South Korea had no future. <laughs> uh, I just want to bring this to relief in terms of saying that each time the odds have been defied by people who've, who've mastered the imagination uh, to defy the odds and to put together a kind of national approach to building their countries. <clears throat> and this is the indispensable element. Now, what do I mean by counterinsurgency economics? It is that first we have to move out of dogma. The developmental community has no model to offer a country like Afghanistan. It's just bankrupt. You know, their structural adjustment model does not work for Russia. How will it work for Afghanistan? Uh, so we need 
Where do we go back? The first thing is to go to, back to, uh, to the experience of American agriculture. Go back to the New Deal. Mobilize the kind of imagination that the New Deal uh, mobilized. Or go to the Dust Bowl. Agricultural markets in practice work the way they've worked in the US or Canada. They've worked with immense sub, uh, state support and partnership. Not through some abstract market, but the market has been an active, active creation. This is the first point. So where is the capacity? The capacity is in used bookstores and, and in departments of agriculture in Kansas, in Minnesota, Wyoming, etc. Why are you giving us <coughs> Beltway bandits who know nothing about agriculture? No, literally, I, I cite to you a case. One group got a project for Kandar for 125, uh, for Helmand, $125 million. They spent $120 million on themselves and $5 million on mobilization in Lashkarga. And of course, nothing changed. Uh, drugs went through the roof. Uh, so this is the, regarding the range of the experience. Second, that economics is as significant a lever as use of force. This is the core idea. What, what is the struggle over? Who's the price? The price in Afghanistan is 70% of the population that is under 22. What have we done in the last eight years for this population? We have not created a single university or upgraded a single university that even meets regional standards. We have not provided the skills. The drug lords provide 1.7 million jobs. Where are the jobs that the international community and the Afghan government have provided? Look at the figures. 56% of assistance between 2002 and 2009 has been spent on security. This is $21.6 billion. $11 billion has been spent on economic and social development, but you see no visible impact because of the contracting uh, uh, model. So here, I want to propose a fundamental change in organizing the development assistance so we create Afghan stakeholders. Let me give you one example. The Afghan construction industry has come to its own. I mean, the change is phenomenally impressive. But I've spoken to a lot of them. 70% of the best Afghan construction firms spend their time chasing contracts. And what do they get? They get the fifth layer of a contract from a US contractor that doesn't do anything. I'll, again, an illustration. A road was given for $125 million to a US contractor. What did this contractor do? Turn around, write around, and give subcontracted to a regional firm for $80 million. What's the contribution of this firm to this entire project? One engineer literally, to supervise that. And what does that subcontractor do? Then turns around and hires a group of Afghan contractors who actually do all the work. So if we want to do this through counterinsurgency economics, the way I'm, I'm phrasing it, let's build on the example of Spain, South Korea, <coughs> Singapore, and the southern states of the United States. So we organize the construction industry in a coherent way that we have either one requirement that no American subcontractor uh, contractor can subcontract more than once. And that for that contract, they need to deliver real services, designs that are appropriate, material, et cetera. Otherwise, they should lose their licenses. There should be a sanctioning process. Or two, better, allow the Afghan government to purchase a first-rate construction firm. They're going on an auction, on a fire auction in Dubai and other places, and allow them to design the big projects, reorganize the construction industry into 200 firms, provide them with reliable contracts for three to five years. In no time, I mean, if you want delivery within 18 months, we can deliver 400 dams, 10,000 kilometers of roads, whatever other, you know, 40% can be provided with micro uh, hydro power uh, electricity too very effectively. American aid can be made <coughs> six to nine times more effective 
if change in authorities takes place. And in that time, you, you mentioned the, the price of the war. The price of the war is coming to, to a level where it's going to be equal to the price of the health care. You cannot change the price of the health care, but you can change the price of the war very, very substantially. And this counterinsurgency economics is a critical piece of this, but we then need to approach economic governance for what it is, a mode of organizing the rules, the authorities, decision rights, responsibilities, and partnerships that can create those sets of results. Afghans, we've been trading for a couple of thousand years. We've been even trading on each other. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, the famous expression that you can rent an Afghan, but you cannot own one, it's true. Uh, we can't be owned, but temporarily people have tried to rent us. Uh, the issue is to change the incentives. And these incentives, I think, can be changed substantially. So what's my concrete proposal? Focus on 10 municipalities next year. That would be 40% of the population of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. The way we built rural solidarity now come to build a program of urban solidarity. Create mechanisms of coordination. You're very kind in mentioning. Uh, why is it that the problem of coordination has emerged since 2005? Why didn't we have any problem of coordination? Because I approached Steve Hadley and coordinated with him <coughs> on behalf of Afghanistan. We were rule-bound and oriented. You, you can invent as many foreign entities to coordinate, they will fail. It, the structure needs to be joint Afghan international mechanism of coordination. It has to have sufficient authority and accountability to be able to coordinate. And I think there are some very interesting ideas on the table that one could explore. These issues, in some, bring what has been missing. Namely that you have a very coherent military community. The US Army has is, is really earned my enormous respect because this army is not the army of 2001 that went to Afghanistan. That's right. It has learned phenomenally, yep. and it has learned for the better. So the comparisons with the Russians are immensely false. This army primarily is interested in reducing violence. It is understanding the need for governance for rule uh, in Pakistan. Um, it didn't even seem to be a leak, although I'm not sure what the source was, but it seems hardly the type of thing you would announce. Um, but well, there, who? excuse me? By the US government or the Pakistani government? Uh, by the US government. Um, but, but we have this odd relationship right now with the Pakistani government where we're pursuing a, a war uh, from the skies in the tribal areas trying to uh, kill terrorists. Um, and at the same time, the Pakistani government at least officially denies cooperation um, and uh, officially often registers protest. Can we keep up this <coughs> dynamic for very long of, of continuing this without the actual active support of the Pakistanis? Well, you raise an issue that have dilemmas both for the United States and for Pakistan. One dilemma for any U.S. government official, and that's why Wendy was right to ask, you know, what was the source, <coughs> is, uh, and, and if the United States had the kind of program that is reported in the press, it probably would be done under covert action authorities and therefore would be something that government officials wouldn't talk about. And um, the dilemma for Pakistanis is um, a country that knows it needs help, knows it needs that the impact on U.S.-Pakistani relations would be devastating if an attack came out of Pakistan and killed Americans here at home, but on the other hand has their own politics and has their own national pride. And we have dilemmas on our side, they have dilemmas on their side, and I think it's one of those cases where too much precision on either side is not helpful. And that's about all I can say. Wendy, let me ask you a question and you can throw in whatever you were gonna say, because I wanna stay on this theme. Um, you have been on the other end of the, the VTC, mm -hmm. the video teleconference, uh, from uh, not specifically Steve Hadley, although maybe in that case, Sometimes. but you've been, the person, uh, you've been the person in Pakistan, the ambassador, who is being told by the president, I need you to get the Pakistanis to do X. How do you do that? 
how, how do you, as an ambassador, engage with the government that you're dealing with um, on such a difficult and challenging issue? If you can address that and whatever else you wanted to say in reaction. Well, uh, I was ambassador in Pakistan in 2001. I arrived there in August of 2001. <laughs> uh, and th let me give you both an historical answer and a current answer, because they're very different. Because the <coughs> political dynamic is very different. Uh, when, of course, when I arrived, it was, a, it was a military dictatorship. It wasn't president then. It was uh, General Musharraf. And the crisis that I was convinced I would be facing as ambassador in Pakistan was one of famine, famine in Afghanistan. Uh, it had been reported by our USAID team that had gone in in, uh, in April that a combination of three years of drought, civil war, and uh, Taliban blocking WFP food distributions had pretty, would pretty much deplete the food supply in Afghanistan by December of 2001. We were already beginning to see um, uh, hundreds, thousands of, hundreds and thousands of refugees beginning to come over into Pakistan, and the Pakistani government was blocking them and Jalazai push, and threatening to push them back. I thought my task was to persuade the uh, Pakistan government to uh, let even more refugees in. Um, with a public that, uh, a political system that felt that uh, everything wrong with Pakistan was because of Afghan refugees, and that uh, the Americans had created this situation, and once again. So, I mean, even before I, um, I did naughty, and I always do naughties, I, um, I went to the Jalazai camp just to see it, to visit it, even before I pre presented credentials, which I was scheduled to do on September 13. And the word got back to President Musharraf that, oh, watch out for this new ambassador. She's aggressive. <laughs> so he did something typical of President Musharraf. He invited me to dinner. And we stayed up and talked. We stayed up very late. He and uh, General Durrani and myself, and this was still in August, and uh, we got to know each other on a personal basis, and I knew what his vision for his country was. So on September 13, when I was instructed by Steve and company, <laughs> to go in and say, are you with us? Are you, are you with us? Are you against us? <laughs> I knew him enough to know that he's a proud general, and I come from a very long military family, that uh, it had to be done very delicately. So I said, are you with us? Are you against us? Because that was my instruction. But I said, I, but look, I know you're with us because uh, we talked. I, I know how you feel. Uh, and I know we can do this together. So look, let's talk now about what we need to do together to get there. So that, that's, that answers your specific question, because I know I haven't been answering your questions <laughs> that you've been giving me up until now. So I, that's the story on that. But today you have a very different situation, because you don't have a, military, a single military guy to go to uh, to get a single answer, which we needed, and we needed then, which was to flip 180 degrees and support us uh, in dropping their policy towards the Taliban. Today, you've got a very complicated political situation. Um, you've got one of the uh, better reforms that President Musharraf instituted was to open up the airways to TV, to private TV. And you've, ha you've got 48 television privately owned television stations now in Pakistan, which is, think about it, enormously important in a country with the illiteracy rate that you've got. Suddenly you've got 170 million people who have access to information instead of just word of mouth or Friday prayers. So the speed to which information can get out is, is, is lightning now in Pakistan. But that doesn't mean that it's all factual or responsible. In fact, if you want, the way I try to understand it is to think about what Rosh Limbaugh and Glenn Beck and Lou Dobbs and, oh, to be fair, Keith Loeb Oberman have done to our political system. Um, it, it is, uh, uh, Pakistan politics is one that is given to conspiracy theories anyway. But now these conspiracy theories just, uh, just run like crazy uh, throughout. So when you have uh, uh, a Kerry Luger bill, and the notion is, uh, this is just America's way to uh, get dominance, seize our weapons, and break up our country. That's the belief that runs 
uh, through the conservative uh, media. Uh, so it's a very complicated politi political system. Uh, a very weak, a, a still a very strong, uh, professional, disciplined military, and ISI I never believed is rogue. I've always believed it's a part of the army and disciplined. It's just army strategy that they reflect. And you've got a political, uh, and it, you've only got two opposition parties if you want, very simplistically, the army and the civilian po politicians. And the civilian politicians um, are not, uh, are very much distant from the people because they're considered, as I mentioned earlier, as elite and um, uh, owners, the captains of industry and the owners of, of the feudal land. So, but then you've got this vast group of people who don't feel anybody's taking care of them. And that's the political environment uh, that we're in. So uh, when you ask me the question, how do we influence this political environment? Um, it's enormously difficult. Um, because I don't, with that kind of a media you've got, it's not a matter of just developing a good PR or public diplomacy strategy, although well, I think we intend to. $150 million intends to go to public diplomacy, but I, I, don't, I don't really get it, uh, given this environment. Um, uh, it's not working through the government if, the, if 100 million people don't trust their government and think that their governments are our puppets anyway. Um, and it's not uh, uh, centered on the military. Uh, I, I do think, I don't want to be pessimistic here. I think that Hillary Clinton got it absolutely right. Uh, she did something that we haven't done in years and years. She went out and instead of staying for three hours or one day and leaving, she stayed for three full days as Secretary of State. She, uh, instead of going in and visiting the president and the prime minister and the chief opposition, Nawaz Sharif and Kiani, behind closed doors for two hours and coming out and giving a two-minute press briefing, leaving the public to say, what were they saying to, to our leaders behind closed doors uh, that they couldn't tell us about, ah, our leaders are puppets, which has happened. M Musharraf is regarded a puppet and Zadari is regarded a puppet. Kiani's very nervous that he will be too. She did something different. She came out and she said, okay, I'm going to go to talk to you students for two hours, you businessmen for two hours, you, you journalists, you ask me anything you wanna ask me, ask me. And the answer she gave, she only, I only got asked the same three questions, which shows the depth of the uh, political sophistication there. Um, was Blackwater gonna take over the country? And, <laughs> Uh, you know, wh why did we want to seize their nukes? But uh, she gave tough answers, tough love. And instead of reacting neg negatively, they loved it. It was a very successful visit. Uh, and if you need evidence, if you need metrics, we all like to talk about metrics, uh, America polls show that our uh, approval rating jumped 7% after her visit. So I think there is a way of approaching um, Pakistan. And I think we need to be attuned to it. Uh, so that would be one suggestion. The other suggestion I've already made, and, not, and that is not to go with our money, with our plans, but to go with uh, a, a true sense of partnership and say, we want, to, we want to help fund, in our little way, your plans with your smart people in innov innovative ways that help you uh, I, th I think we need to rethink the way we, uh, we conduct our diplomacy uh, with Pakistan, and I think it can be successful. I think we need to rethink the way we uh, have the lighting buttons uh, here uh, at the, in this room. Almost. <laughs> Um, yes, if anybody wants to get up and dance, please, now would be the time. Um, so uh, we're, uh, I have been uh, selfishly enjoying uh, asking questions. Um, and so now we're going to turn to uh, the audience for some questions. Uh, Ashley uh, has the microphone. And what I ask uh, is that uh, questioners identify themselves. 
um, try to be fairly limited, and I'm also going to ask our panelists to try to be fairly limited in the response so we can get in uh, a bunch of people. Uh, so we'll start right up here. Hi, Barbara Slavin from the Washington Times. Uh, very good presentations. Thank you. In President Obama's speech, and Hillary Clinton has spoken of this, Karzai has spoken of this, they've talked about reintegration of some Taliban into the mainstream of, of <coughs> Afghanistan. Do you think it's possible, uh, especially given the Pakistani attitude? Do you think that the Afghan Taliban movement can be divided up, say, with uh, Hekmatyar or Haqqani, perhaps more willing to uh, be rented, if not owned, uh, than Mullah Omar? Uh, and is this essential if this 18-month strategy is going to work? Thank you. Was it directed? Uh, to Ashraf Ghani uh, and to the others if you have a comment. Uh, do, uh, Please. <laughs> the presidential campaign had one very positive aspect that I think the, the Western media has not noticed. Now there's a national consensus in Afghanistan that we need a political framework for peace building. And we need to understand the reasons for grievances. I think because counterinsurgency demands a very unified insurgency. We've been attributing more unity to the insurgency than it has. We need to be able to approach the issues. Distinct provinces have distinctive issues. At times, even districts have distinctive issues. And the critical issue still is the weakness of the government, not the strength of the insurgency. So if we strengthen the government capability, the balance will shift. Uh, because ordinary people today are caught in, two, in a vicious grip of the one side, a government that is predatory, on the other side, an insurgency. If we make the government govern, the equation changes. And as part of this, outreach is essential. How the shape will take place needs to be very concrete in terms of things. So I would not get to those big names first. The critical issue is first local level commanders, youth leaders that have been alienated and then build up. Uh, one caution, I've reviewed all the peace agreements that were concluded from 1990 to 2004, and I've written a long article on it. These things normally take three to 10 years. Look at, look at Ireland. No, but the no, foundations don't. need to be laid. It, it's a complementary thing. Uh, the reason for this is a word of caution. Let's not box ourselves into a definition of success that then we are not going to reach. Because what Steve is saying is essential. 18 months is the point of transition. To begin, not to to begin, begin the, the, the transition. point of transition, not the end point of this game. A lot of the interpretations are the other way around. Steve, did you have a reaction, or should I go to the next question? No. no. I'm in the back here with a handsome tie. It's Mike. Uh, yes, uh, Mike Pevsner, U.S. Senate staff. Uh, Dr. Hadley, uh, you made an interesting point about the impact of uh, a potential terrorist attack going back to the tribal areas. I wonder if, uh, for, for any of the panelists, uh, what could you quantify more? What would be the impact on United States policy toward Pakistan? And this isn't in the realm of the hypothetical. We just saw the arrest of uh, you know, Mr. Zazi up in uh, New York and Denver, uh, who had uh, reportedly trained in Pakistan. So how would that affect uh, our strategy? I would ask you, because the first place I would look would be some reaction from the Congress in terms of legislation and whether they would continue to support um, aid and assistance to Pakistan at the levels we're talking about and in the right spirit, which we're trying to get to, of, of partnership. So I, I think there's what would be the public opinion reaction, and then how would that be manifested in terms of legislation for the Congress? And you don't know, um, but it's a place you don't want to be. Can, can I just add that I think that a lot would depend upon um, Pakistani reaction, immediate reaction. Uh, I, uh, I find it somewhat d disturbing that in the Pakistani press and among its officials, no one's talking about the Hadley case. 
N no one in Pakistan. And like Shal Taiba, no one's really condemning like Shal Taiba. And, and the thought in Pakistan that Lakshal Taiba uh, has international um, uh, goals uh, to, to spread terrorism internationally isn't considered in Pakistan. We know it here, but uh, there's a big gap. And I think we need to close that gap um, if we're going to get the right response if something terrible did happen. Who in the back there, the gentleman in the brown sweater? Thank you very much. I'm Efti Hassan from West of America, partial to the border region service. We have a nine hours of broadcast to the border region area. My question is from Ashraf Ghani. Could you please elaborate on the uh, what kind of influence the United States can exercise in the coming days? To, uh, on the Karzai government to deliver, and what do you mean by effective partnership on the civilian side? Thank you very much. Certainly. Effective partnership on the civilian side means that each side addresses its corruption problem. The model of USAID needs to be fundamentally overhauled if we are going to get an effective partnership. The model of delivering through SERP needs to be fundamentally revised if we are going to get an effective partnership. The model of giving billions of dollars to UN agencies without asking them to disclose what they're doing with that money and accounting for it needs to be fundamentally revised. So this is one part. The negative elements. There is plenty of evidence, a lot of it from government accountability office reports. Pentagon's reports are superb in this regard. Look at the last report uh, of the Inspector General uh, of the Defense, uh, Defense Department. These are documented court cases of corruption. Uh, one case, a road in Logar province was costing $9 million. The contractor was paid. They increased it to $18 million, and the one who was bribing uh, was paying the major $2 million for it. It's been indicted. You know, it's been established. Second is the Afghan corruption. We've dropped 62 points in four years in Transparency International's index. It's unprecedented in the annals of history. No other country has dropped. When countries become very corrupt, they stay there. Uh, we have had a, an accomplishment, though there's an Afghan poet who's, who's written a poet saying, poor Afghanistan, even on corruption, you could not come number one. Somalia beat you. <laughs> uh, we need trying. to change. We need to change the image. What would be the target? 100-point upward swing in Transparency International's rating within the next two years. That is feasible. Positively, we come to design, not a quarrel, not a blame game, but a real set of objectives and show our responsibility. Uh, Afghanistan is not the country of the United States. But go to Helmand, <coughs> you will find the sons of high-ranking officials of this government serving as soldiers. You will not find the single son or brother of a high-ranking government official serving in Helmand as a, as a foot soldier. That's the difference. Here, patriotism has manifested itself in terms of international service. When their commander-in-chief tells them to go serve, they serve. And Bill Taylor's son is, is served here with remarkable distinction. Uh, John Taylor served two tours, etc. I know a lot of people. We need to take responsibility. Partnership is about us taking the lead to take our partners and show them an exit route. The exit route is that we are capable of managing and running our country. So this is critical. They, in turn, need to change their mechanisms of support that they become the catalyst for building of Afghan capabilities. And I think this is exactly the right approach that is being hit upon, to train our institutions, you know, our security institutions, but also the others. Uh, it takes two to tango, and the two need to agree on all the moves. Today, every move on one side is mismatched by the other. Uh, so uh, that, that's uh, fundamentally uh, about changing. What was your second question? Why, why don't we yeah. why don't we move it on? Uh, Yes, back here. Yes.
Mohammed Adif for VOA uh, Television for Pakistan. Uh, I wanted to ask you uh, about the situation of Pakistan's establishment. Uh, do you think that financial aid is enough to satisfy Pakistan and to address its concerns in Afghanistan? And uh, secondly, uh, is it okay to tell Pakistan that the U.S. has a long commitment in Afghanistan and then announce a pullout date? Thank you. Who were you asking? Were you, a were you asking Mr. Hatley? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'll take the first one. <laughs> you can do it first. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, it's interesting if you think about what President Bush said when he announced the surge in Afghanistan and what President Obama said announcing the surge in Afghanistan, they weren't that different. We're going to surge in troops. We're going to secure the population. We're going to buy some time for the building of local institutions so that as those institutions gain strength, we can begin to pull out based on that success and our troops ultimately can come home with honor. And even President Bush began to suggest sort of, as we call it, a time horizon when that would be done. And it's interesting, President Bush makes his statement on Iraq and everybody ignores the time horizon and says, you know, it was all conditions-based. The conditions will never be met because he wants to stay forever. Why anyone thought we would want to stay forever in Iraq, I don't know, but that's what they said. <laughs> President Obama says roughly the same thing and everybody ignores that he's making a commitment and, and saying that it's any, that reductions are conditions-based and they focus on the date and say, you see, it's an exit plan, we're out of there. And I think probably in retrospect, they maybe wish they had been a little less precise about a date. Uh, because what they have been saying subsequently, what the President said in the speech, if you read it carefully, what Secretary Gates and Secretary Clinton have been saying is, well, that date is a date when we begin to transfer responsibility, which will allow us to begin to come home. But um, what that means in terms of size and everything else will depend on conditions on the ground. And there's nothing about rate. There's nothing about end date. And they have tried to make clear that it will depend on success in Afghans standing up, taking responsibility, and the United States can then begin to uh, step back. Um, as, as Secretary Gates said, we're not going to throw this baby into the swimming pool and then walk away. So, you know, look, I think what is important is that the administration make clear to Afghans, make clear to Al Qaeda and Taliban, to make clear to the Pakistanis, and to make clear to our own forces <coughs> that we are committed to succeeding in this task because it's in the interests of all of us. And the President has an important piece of that because in the end of the day, it is the President that is the glue that holds all this together. And I think he has to make very clear that he personally is committed to this project and is committed to succeeding. I think they've started on that. I think uh, the national security principles have done that. I think we're going to need to hear a little more from President Obama on that as well. Great. Yeah. I'm Viola Ginger from Bloomberg News. Um, I'd like to hear from, from each of you uh, with uh, General McChrystal and Ambassador Eikenberry uh, scheduled to testify over the next few days in, on the Hill. What do you think they need to say um, regarding each of their um, individual areas of responsibility? What do they need to say to the American people, to the Congress, and to uh, the Afghan and Pakistani people? I'll be very brief. They need to say that they're going to work like this. That yes, they have separate responsibilities, but that they are going to do it in an integrated way, bringing all elements of U.S. national power together to achieve a common objective and to work hand in glove with our allies and with the Afghan officials. That's what they have uh, got to say. That's the message that everybody needs to hear. And then they've got to go off and, and do it. 
I, I think they need to convince the American public that the concept of smart power is actually operational. That smart power is about use of all national instruments, and that these two remarkable individuals, who, who both are truly remarkable leaders, can work together <coughs> in perfect unison and bring about those sites. Ambassador Eikenberry's transformation into a civilian is a remarkable e event because he's not a general, a former general now serving as ambassador. He's an ambassador that is performing the chief role of a chief diplomat and the, that. In terms of the Afghan public, they need to demonstrate that the Afghan public is going to be the center of gravity. Together, the two have achieved something very significant. A remarkable reduction in the rate of civilian casualties has taken place. And that needs to be communicated, both for the effort that it's taken and that there will be a lot more uh, concern about it. Related, the point that General McChrystal's paper and also there's a memorandum of understanding signed between Gen uh, General McChrystal and Ambassador Eikenberry on key areas of priority. That needs to be communicated in very clear ways because that memorandum, again, is quite, quite significant in terms of how it's going to, to be done. And they also need, I think, to lay down the grounds for both London and for Kabul. We need two conferences, a conference in London where we need to get the international dimensions right. The partnership that we've spoken needs to take form. Then we need a conference in Kabul where the regional and the national dimension really need to become very concrete. And this is their opportunity to lay down. Uh, and they need to assure President Karzai, as they have assured him on the ground, that now he is the president of Afghanistan, that the election period and other issues are over, that there is truly a mechanism of reaching out and agreeing on areas of core responsibility and joint responsibility. Well, uh, with regards to Pakistan, uh, I don't know that these two guys would be the ones to deliver the message, but the message needs to be reinforced that our relationship is with the Pakistani people, that we think, that we believe that, um, that it is a, a, a larger problem that includes the whole region, including Pakistan, but that the solution will come when the uh, 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 aspirations of the Pakistani people are met and that we're there as reliable partners uh, well into the future, as President Obama said, long after the guns have, have been silenced, um, uh, to work with the Pakistani people on what they need, which is energy and jobs and, and uh, rule of law and safety in their villages. And we have a last question here, this young Afghan gentleman in the red tie. Thank you. Very insightful presentation. My, my name is Asiba Mayun, and I work for the Institute for the Study of War. Uh, the question I have is just to pick up from where you left, Dr. Ghani. You said President Karzai should be given assurances. Uh, one of the other tactics in the sort of absence of the political strategy, there are two tactics. One was civilian search. The other that seems to be coming out of the administration is this whole idea of bypassing President Karzai or some way working around him. Is that even possible? Should it be done? The Afghan system is unitary. We are like France. We are not a federal system. And Americans have fundamental difficulty grasping unitary systems. So part of the elementary education for each person that serves in Afghanistan is to understand our political culture. That political culture is unitary. This does not mean that you endorse ineffective centralization. Today we have a dual difficulty. We have a dysfunctional center that blocks initiatives. Uh, example, a request from a provincial department of education, uh, to take a random example, could sit in months in the Ministry of Education without being answered. That's dysfunctional. This is not a center at work. Simultaneously, you have one of the worst forms of local predatory behavior, where a district, say, in Badakhshan, not to take the south, 
consisting of 1,000 families, is taken hostage by one commander who forces them to cultivate drugs and pay them in drugs. Uh, this problem cannot be solved by, by, by bas bypassing the center. We need to come with a mech. Afghan Afghanistan has been fragmented through ill-designed policies of the international community in the last eight years, particularly in the last five, because there's an entire second bureaucracy. I call it the parallel bureaucracy uh, of NGOs, the UN, USAID, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. No country will be able to build credible and accountable governance with that kind of a second bureaucracy. The second bureaucracy now needs to be tackled, fundamentally and restructured, if we want it. Uh, NPRTs, again, need major revisiting because they were designed for as a two-year temporary device to then be incorporated within the structures of the Afghan government, within the Ministry of Finance and Interior. Instead, they've become a realm unto themselves. And as Steve said earlier, uh, Secretary Sekjen of NATO did not know what they did. I, they asked me to do a, a speech la, uh, uh, last year in Spain, so I asked for a survey. There was no rhyme or rhythm to the PRTs. The critical variable predicting it is the personality of the colonel and the personality of the governor. And when a colonel leaves, it starts all over again. Uh, so we need to understand that international community cannot go on improvising governance devices that have not been tested. We need to come to design of governance arrangements that serve a goal, uh, and that's the opportunity. But simultaneously, a clear message has to go to Mr. Karzai that is the message of the Afghan people. The message of the Afghan public needs to be echoed back to Mr. Karzai. The Afghan public wants a government that functions. And I, for one, who am not willing to serve in the government, is going to the gov give the government the hardest time possible if I see any evidence of corruption. This is not Washington's fight. It's ours. Because it's the future of our grandchildren that are at stake. Uh, so I urge every Afghan now to have voice and to demand accountability so that the issue is not taken as an agenda of foreign imposition, but as a national demand for an accountable governance and a government that functions. That's the only way that we can get change. And I think that's the message that needs to be delivered. The international community, as Wendy was saying earlier regarding Pakistan, must define its partner. The partner is the Afghan public. Without having the men and women who is starving to invest back in hope. And the question of women is really critical because it's not come. For the first time in our history, we have over a, probably close to one million female-headed households where the children of these households are likely to be condemned to three or four generations of poverty unless we do something about it. Uh, and those voices need to be heard. Afghanistan is a place unseen. Afghans or people are unmet. So mythologies are beginning to pervade regarding what Afghans want. What we want is what my neighbors in Baltimore or Bethesda wanted, a better future for their children. Safety, rule of law, predictability. Our image needs to be rescued, and the responsibility of our leadership and all our actors is to rescue this mythologized or mythological image of Afghanistan as the grave of empires, or as a people who are interested in violence. We have suffered more from violence than any other people. Let us not forget that fact. We, we sacrificed two and a half millions of our lives to break the former Soviet Union. Now we want lives that are meaningful. And I hope that the partnership that we've been speaking in events like this become the mechanism uh, for bringing that uh, very laudable goal in a goal that is very human uh, into reality. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, this uh, entire two-hour session, uh, I'm, I'm sure you all agree, has been a tremendous treat. Uh, the three of you have spent uh, three fascinating careers 
uh, furthering the interests of your countries and uh, globally. Um, so please join me again in thanking them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please, please also join me. Uh, no event like this would be possible without the very hard work um, of uh, all of our staff at USIP, particularly Ashley and Azita, uh, my boss Bill Taylor, uh, and the rest of the institute that supports all of the great work that we're able to do. So thank you, everybody, and thank you all for coming. Thank you.